Where did the universe come from? Our solar system is one of innumerable systems that comprise billions of galaxies strewn about the universe. This lesson explores how the universe began and evolved. The universe probably began more than 13 billion years ago, when a tremendous release of energy, called the Big Bang, initiated the formation of matter. Three important observations support the Big Bang theory. The expansion of the universe, the cosmic microwave background, and the abundance of light elements. In 1929, Edwin Hubble observed that light from very distant galaxies is Doppler red-shifted, from which he determined that they are all moving away from us. He also noted that the more distant a galaxy is from Earth, the faster it is moving away. The velocity with which each galaxy appears to be receding from us is related to its distance from us by a constant known as the Hubble constant. The Hubble constant is estimated to be 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec of distance, where one parsec is equal to 3.26 light years. The expansion of the universe can be projected backwards in time to a pre-expansion initial state, the Big Bang. The Hubble constant can be used to estimate the time since the Big Bang, which is the age of the universe. It is more than 13 billion years old. While experimenting with a radio telescope in 1964, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson detected a uniform microwave background that appeared to be coming from beyond our galaxy. This cosmic microwave background corresponds to a black body radiation temperature of 2.7 kelvins. If the Big Bang did indeed occur, a remnant background radiation would remain from the intense radiation that the early moments of the Big Bang would have produced. This predicted remnant background radiation was calculated as being the same as that of the cosmic microwave background detected by Penzias and Wilson. More precise measurements, made in 1992, showed some small inhomogeneities in the cosmic microwave background. These homogeneities may have provided the sites for galaxy formation. The Big Bang theory also predicts that light elements, such as hydrogen, helium, and lithium, would have been fused from protons and neutrons in the first few minutes after the Big Bang. The theory predicts that the Big Bang would have produced these light elements in relative abundances that are the same as those now found in material thought to be primordial. It is from these primordial materials that first stars formed. Stars are thought to originate from clouds of mostly hydrogen gas that are present throughout the universe. A gas cloud contracts in response to self-gravitation, and as the gas contracts its kinetic energy, and therefore its temperature, increases. When the temperature in the center of this protostar is sufficiently high, hydrogen undergoes fusion to form helium in a process known as hydrogen burning. After this fusion begins, the protostar is a full-fledged star. The energy from fusion increases the star's interior pressure, and as a result, the gravitational contraction ceases. The total power radiated by a star is represented by its luminosity. Studies of nearby stars show that a star's mass is related to its luminosity. The more mass of a star, the greater its luminosity. The Hertzsprung-Russell diagram plots a star's luminosity versus its surface temperature. This is used for classifying stars. Most stars, like our Sun, fall along the main sequence of the plot. Stars appear on this curve a few tens of millions of years after their birth. Those similar in mass to the Sun remain there for about 10 billion years. The Sun has been there for nearly 5 billion years. Where would a main sequence star that is much more massive than the Sun be found on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? Correct. A much more massive star would have a much higher luminosity. Its parameters would therefore be plotted at the upper end of the main sequence. As hydrogen burning in a star progresses, a core of helium forms. Therefore, 
the intensity of hydrogen burning decreases and the outer region of the star begins to collapse on the core. The resulting temperature increase in the shell around the helium core initiates more hydrogen burning. This, in turn, causes a significant expansion of the outer region of the star. By this process, a star similar in mass to the Sun becomes a red giant. Next, the helium core of the star contracts and the higher temperature initiates helium burning. Meanwhile, hydrogen burning continues in the shell around the core. After only a few tens of millions of years after leaving the main sequence stage, the star runs out of fuel. It collapses to become a white dwarf about the size of the Earth. The outer shell blows off as a planetary nebula. The white dwarf radiates its remnant energy until, at length, it becomes a cold, dark hulk known as a black dwarf. On the other hand, a main sequence star that is much more massive, with several times the mass of the Sun, will evolve to a supergiant. It initially follows the helium burning sequence previously discussed. However, because of its massive size, fusions involving heavier nuclei occur and produce elements as heavy as iron and nickel. Thus, a massive supergiant star develops an onion shell structure, with layers of progressively heavier elements toward the core. As a massive star runs out of fuel, it rapidly collapses. This contraction results in extremely high temperature and pressure in the core. Heavy iron and nickel nuclei are broken apart, and free protons and electrons are forced together to form neutrons. So much energy is released in the final collapse of the core that the star blows off its outer region in a massive explosion known as a supernova. The star's remaining core forms an extremely dense neutron star. A neutron star with a diameter of only 10 kilometers has a mass greater than that of the Sun. If the neutron star has a mass several times that of the Sun, it contracts to an even smaller diameter and becomes a black hole. A black hole is so dense that even light is unable to escape its gravitational field. It can only be viewed indirectly from the material surrounding and feeding it, and gas jets propelled away from it. We know that the universe is currently expanding. Will this expansion continue forever? There are three basic possibilities. That the universe is an infinite, ever-expanding open universe. That it is an infinite flat universe that is approaching zero expansion and that it is a closed universe, one that will eventually stop expanding because of the effects of gravity and will then collapse back onto itself in a big crunch. The average mass density of the universe determines its type. If its mass density is greater than some critical density, the universe is open. If it is equal to the critical density, the universe is flat. If it is less than the critical density, the universe is closed. Estimates of the visible matter in the universe place the mass density at less than the critical density. However, there is evidence that most of the universe is made up of non-luminous dark matter. This unseen dark matter is necessary to explain the motion of stars and galaxies. Without it, galaxies would fly apart. The gravitational lensing of starlight by what is thought to be clumps of dark matter has been observed. Dark matter has also been indirectly detected by observations of its gravitational effects on a gas cloud surrounding a distant galaxy. Current estimates of mass density that include dark matter place our galaxy's density at very near the critical density, indicating that ours is a flat universe.